Good evening. I'm Jackie Miller, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Seattle, and very glad that you could all join us on this gorgeous Seattle evening uh, for tonight's discussion on U.S. Qatar relations with His Excellency Ambassador Mohammed Al Khwari. Um, and the ambassador just got off a plane minutes ago, uh, literally came straight from the airport. We are going to try not to remind him that uh, it's actually past 10 in DC. Um, it's uh, it's only 7 o'clock or so here, so. Uh, five in the morning. And five, and five o'clock in the morning in Doha. So let's stick with the 7 o'clock. That sounds a little more reasonable. Um, so, but thank you for coming to talk to us today about uh, the US. Qatar partnership, which is a very uh, important partnership both for the United States and for Qatar. Um, we have a couple of uh, special guests I want to briefly acknowledge before we get to tonight's program. First of all, we have some students and teachers here tonight from the Northwest School, which is one of our partner schools. And they were very recently Qatar, I think twice Molly was Qatar, at the Model United Nations. So. Um, be prepared for some very well-informed questions. <laughs> and maybe I should just, Molly, you wanna come and give the intro, or? You're good? Okay. <laughs> All right, so you're gonna be stuck with me. Um, and we also have representatives and students from One World Now with us tonight. And if you don't know One World Now, you should. It is a great uh, Seattle-based nonprofit that focuses on global youth leadership with a, and a, a very heavy emphasis on teaching Chinese and Arabic, and One World Now gets funding from, or support from the Qatar Foundation for this um, Arabic language training, and I know they're excited to be here tonight um, as well. And the ambassador is quite busy, not just getting off a, a plane, but uh, as you know, we just wrapped up the Camp David Summit, uh, at Camp David, Maryland, um, where the Emir of the state of Qatar was there, along with other Gulf leaders. Um, and the ambassador may have some insights to offer us from those meetings, although this meeting is on the record and is being live tweeted um, as well, so be careful. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, the ambassador was appointed in December 2013 as the uh, ambassador of the state of Qatar to the United States. He came to DC from 10 years in Paris, um, so fluent French speaker as well where he was also um, accredited to Switzerland and the Holy See, and then was in 2007 also made, because that wasn't enough hats, the non-resident ambassador to Monaco and Portugal. Um, this is part of a very long and impressive foreign service career that includes postings in Iran, uh, in Tehran, uh, an earlier posting in the other Washington, uh, earlier, and also in Madrid. And he was also the director of American and European uh, Affairs at the, at the Foreign Ministry. So we have a, a very well-informed uh, guest with us tonight who also has a very nice local connection in that he went to Portland State University for his undergraduate degree, got his bachelor's in political science, so has uh, done his fair share fair share of field trips um, to Seattle in his day. And the ambassador is going to talk to us tonight, of course, about U.S. Qatar relations and regional issues, um, many of which have been in the news of late, from Syria to Saudi Arabia to Yemen and, and to Qatar itself. And for a country roughly the size of Connecticut, a little bit smaller than Connecticut, Qatar wields significant economic and political power. Qatar holds the third largest proven natural gas reserves and 25 billion, with a B, barrels of uh, proven oil reserves. Um, this uh, means that Qatar's 250,000 uh, citizens enjoy the world's highest per capita income and the world's lowest unemployment rate. Um, aside from this economic strength, Qatar is an important security partner for the United States in a region that has, uh, is seeing some conflict and some instability, and has been a very important partner for the United States since the Persian Gulf War. The US and Qatar recently signed an extension of their defense cooperation agreement, a 10-year extension of that uh, agreement, and uh, Qatar hosts a very large uh, US air base, um, which is very important for the United States in that region. Qatar has positioned itself as a mediator and an interlocutor in a number of regional conflicts and has supported NATO-led operations in Libya 
and US, ongoing US-led operations uh, in, against ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, whatever you prefer to call them, uh, in Syria. We also have some very extensive economic ties um, that, uh, that form a foundation for the relationship, including some very relevant local ones. Uh, the United States is Qatar's largest foreign investor and single largest source of imports, um, which means that there's a very robust uh, trade relationship with Qatar along with this economic, along with the security and this political relationship. There are over 120 companies, U.S. companies operating in the country and six universities, including my alma, alma mater, Cornell, along with uh, Georgetown and, you know, Texas A&M, um, have opened campuses. Uh, in Qatar. And to make the bilateral relationship very relevant locally, uh, Qatar Airways is buying 50 or so. Uh, Boeing 777s might be getting some purchasing rights for more. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not at all an expert on, on the airline industry, but to me that seems like a lot of airplanes. So um, we'll have a robust discussion with the ambassador tonight on the U.S. Qatar bilateral relationship and on many of the regional issues that are threatening stability in the Gulf. But first, the ambassador is going to come up here and give us some framing thoughts and remarks, and then he and I will have a discussion, and then it's your turn to get into the discussion. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. I'm so uh, honored to be here. Uh, to remind me of when I was a student in uh, Portland, I used to drive to Seattle with some friends. So uh, uh, last time I was here, it was uh, 1980. Oh. So it's been like almost 85 years, you know. And so, um, uh, well, I will leave the uh, U.S. category uh, part in the end, but I will start with the regional uh, issue. Uh, so I just prepared some remarks very quick just to uh, uh, prepare the ground for uh, interaction and uh, dialogue between us. So uh, three general principles to be considered regarding the, the Middle East. First, there are no immediate solution for the Middle East crisis. Second, solution cannot be imposed from the outside. Third, political solutions are always preferable. The word solution is somehow overrated. Perhaps we should think in terms of gradual steps, not solution. Uh, in Syria, the removal of Bashar al-Assad is the first step to the solution. And given the reality in the ground, it seems inevitable. It is also a matter of real politics. If Bashar remains, violence in Syria will continue. The second step is to shape a political transition uh, framework. This one requires recognize the legitimate actors on the ground, meet political demands by popular opposition, map a fair sectarian representation on the governing body. The third stage consists of a set of a concrete steps. Send peacekeeping forces to stabilize the country. Train responsible opposition elements. Organize an international support. Start a national dialogue across the political spectrum. Regarding Iran, a deal with Iran is more plausible than the two alternatives of war and the nuclear Iran. However, this is not forever deal. In fact, it is more like an interim accord than a lasting agreement. The stability of the region depends on the distributions of power. In terms of geopolitics, there are two strategies under consideration. One, based on the principle of superpower and exclusive US dominance. The other, 
on the principle of double balancing and minimal US engagement. Either strategy requires two things, strengthening GCC security and defense capabilities, an active American role in the region. A weakened GCC means superpower Iran, and a complete US non-engagement leaves the door open for Russia and China. Russia and China. The peace process between Israelis and Palestinians is essential for the stability of the region. At this stage, endgame negotiations seems very unlikely. Until there is an Israeli government willing to make a decision on the core issues such as borders, Jerusalem, and refugees, there will be no agreement. The talks should set a definite time framework and parameters. The Arab Peace Initiative provides a good negotiating framework based on two state solution and the 1967 borders. Without Gaza, any solution will be fertile. I think this is something just I wanted to share with you. And if we go uh, to the Yemen and Libya, there are three primary steps must be, be taken. Stop for foreign meddling double international support and rebuilding efforts. Engage all the parties involved to start a national dialogue. Egypt could set an example of engaging moderate Islamic parties. This process worked well in Tunisia. This will win the new government in Cairo the international supports it needs to recover its economy. Go back to the GCC now. The GCC state needs to start a process of gradual political reforms. Gradual because in the region like the Middle East, stability is a key. In terms of domestic affairs, the GCC countries need to reinvent themselves. A new means of political legitimacy must be developed alongside traditional ones. Political reform, civil institutions, municipal elections, participation of women and the youth, freedom of the press, minority rights. The GCC states should re-emerge into the world political stage as a united political body in the face of regional challenges. However, this should come with respect for differences and political diversity. First step, reduce superpower dependency by developing military capabilities and resources beyond the regular armed sales. Train local cadres, build cap capable military institution, and most importantly, military sciences. Second step, invest in public image not only in the U.S., but also inside. Uh, now we have, we'll go to a very important issue, I think, which is that terrorism. Uh, the war and terrorism will continue for years to come, unfortunately. That is because the solution to terrorism is not exclusively military, but begins with the fighting its roots causes, a process that takes generations. It is a process that involves good governance, civil rights, economic development, investment in human capital, empowerment of youth and empowerment of women and above all, education. The defeat of ISIS, while blizzardable, will not solve the problem. As a recent UN counterterrorism report shows, 
the military defeat of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, which is not impossible in the medium term, could have the unintended consequences of scattering violence foreign terrorist fighters across the world, further complicating the response. We know this from historical experience. Over the past three decades, extremist fighters have proven capability of transforming themselves at the end of the battles, such was the case of Al-Qaeda. <coughs> The overthrow of Afghanistan Taliban helped and lashed a new generation of jihadists in, into new battlefields in Syria and Iraq. <laughs> Regarding Iraq, I think this is an important issue that engaging Sunnis in the political process is a crucial step forward. However, this depends on the Iraqi leadership's willingness and most importantly, its ability to do so. The U.S. could play a significant role in this regard. At the same time, Iran should stop meddling in Iraqi's internal affairs, a policy which only fuels sectarian sentiment in the country. The GCC state could play a very important role positive role in pacifying Sunnis, tribes, and factions, and redirecting their energy toward state building. Again, this is depend on the willingness of the Iraqi government to take serious steps toward political inclusion. And I won't go more than this because I would like to have uh, a dialogue with you and interaction more than just uh, saying this remark. Just because these remarks, I think it will uh, open the ground for more question and more debate, healthy debate. <laughs> I know you, you have uh, some question and some of them will be very hard question, but I would be <laughs> glad to answer them. Please ask any question. You know, do not hesitate, do not be shy, say this ambassador, what can I do? Ask me any question you like. Well, let's, um, we'll start a dialogue first, a quick dialogue. If I could ask you to, to sit and then we will open it up. I saw some hands go up pretty quickly, so I will uh, keep it brief and I'll just uh, start with a couple of questions. I think the microphone might help. Um, thank you for that uh, tour of the region and some of the many, many um, areas that need a lot of attention. I want to start first a little closer to home, if we, we could, and look at a particularly uh, uh, a different aspect of the U.S. Uh, Qatar relationship. And I spoke a bit briefly about the, the economic ties and, and didn't mention that the Minister of Finance uh, earlier this year announced uh, that Qatar would be investing 30 billion more in the United States over the next five years. Um, to further strengthen uh, the, the U.S. Qatar relationship. But I want to ask you first about a different investment that Qatar made 10 years ago in our Gulf Coast, in our Gulf states, um, when the government uh, donated 100 million for Katrina relief um, after that, um, that uh, disaster here. And you just got back from New Orleans, from Mississippi, from Louisiana, to meet with some of the beneficiaries of the Katrina uh, benefit fund, the, the Qatar Katrina fund. And I just wanted to ask you what has Qatar's return been on that investment and has your work on our Gulf Coast given you any lessons learned for your other humanitarian assistance projects around the world? Uh, thank you very much. You know, uh, this, uh, we initiated this uh, fund, uh, Katrina fund, or what we call it, Qatar Katrina. You know, it's, uh, we are going to publish a book now for the 10th anniversary of Katrina, which will uh, be on the 29th of uh, uh, August. Can you just speak a little quiet? Ah, okay. So um, we are publishing a book and we are producing a film to show uh, all what we have done in uh, New Orleans and uh, Mississippi and Alabama. We chose uh, 18 projects. Uh, focusing on 
uh, healthcare, schools, universities, uh, uh, education, uh, uh, housing, uh, and we donated hundred million dollars. And uh, I'm so proud when I was there just uh, a month ago to see that uh, I met with a number of uh, community leaders and students who benefited our scholarship. We gave around 2,000 scholarship for students in, uh, in New Orleans. And uh, ordinary citizen in the, in the, in the cities. Uh, to see that uh, our contribution is benefiting a lot of, uh, a lot of people. And uh, I think that uh, for us it's uh, part and parcel of our culture and our, uh, one of the barriers of our diplomacy also to uh, humanitarian assistance, which is something very, very important. And it's not only we, we, we had this thing in the United States, we had it in Japan when they had this uh, the earthquake and we had it and uh, now we are uh, helping uh, Haiti uh, with the 20 million dollars. Uh, we allocate from our budget annually almost one million dollars for a human humanitarian assistance. Uh, uh, this is something we are uh, uh, proud of it and uh, it's uh, part of our uh, diplomacy and foreign service uh, and uh, our culture because it, uh, our culture is always you have to help, you have to be beside the people and needs. So uh, uh, I think uh, we saw this happen in the United States and uh, we have an excellent relation with the United States and uh, we appreciate what the United States is doing for Qatar, uh, helping us to develop our economy and uh, uh, military and security cooperation is very strong. So uh, I think we should be there when there is uh, a need for uh, any help. Our friends, our allies, and all, uh, all parts of the world, we are uh, working on this same, uh, same policy. And uh, I think uh, humanitarian assistance, you have to uh, work very hard on this thing. Thank you. I want to get to um, some of these these regional issues that you you started to address. Um, just give us a you gave us a broad overview, and that have certainly been in the the headlines. And two weeks ago, the the anti ISIS coalition um, members, the twenty four odd members of the coalition of which Qatar is a part, met in Paris. Um, uh, and these these discussions about stopping ISIS were held against a backdrop of of recent ISIS gains in Iraq's Anbar province and the seizing um, Ramadi, which is a majority Sunni city um, in the Anbar province. <coughs> and the uh, US Deputy Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, said that um, politically and military, militarily the strategy was working. Right? It was a sound strategy, the strategy is working. And your foreign minister appeared to take issue with that uh, assessment of, of operations against ISIS and said that coalition airstrikes in Iraq were hopeless uh, without a process of national reconciliation in Iraq. And I was hoping you could just talk to us a bit more about that. What does national reconciliation entail? Um, and can anyone but Iraqi leaders make that push? You said in, in your remarks that there was a role for the United States. Um, but how can external players help with a process for uh, internal reconciliation in Iraq? Uh, first of all, fighting ISIS, I, th I don't think we can uh, do it overnight. And uh, uh, we should uh, seek the roots and the causes of terrorism in our region. Uh, and there is no military, uh, we cannot fight uh, ISIS or terrorism by uh, military means alone. Uh, we should. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, I'm saying that terrorism, you know, cannot be uh, uh, fought uh, military by military means alone. We should uh, uh, seek the, the causes and the roots of the, uh, this problem. 
this is we have to see the good governance we have to uh, civil rights uh, education uh, empowerment of women empowerment of youth all these uh, things I think we have to work together all of us to develop to develop a strategy in our region with the help of United States and the countries in the region to fight terrorism because we had Al-Qaeda, now we have ISIS. Tomorrow, if we continue without really covering or uh, tackling these routes and causes, we'll have another terrorist groups will come. So uh, what are we going to do? Immediate, uh, taking immediate measures to fight military, it's important. This is no doubt about it. But for the long term, we have to uh, develop strategy together to, to fight. In Iraq, for example, if we do not integrate the Sunni in the political process, in the uh, national uh, reconciliation uh, government, we cannot really have any stability and peace in, the, in Iraq. And this is, depends on the willingness of the Iraqi government. They have to really work to see, because they are saying, you know, Sunni, Sunni, they are not minority. When you are 40% in the country, you are not minority. Uh, uh, over 5%, human beings, even if you are 1%, you are important. So I think uh, 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 these kind of uh, measures and uh, developing a strategy, we can uh, solve a lot of problem in our region. In Iraq and Syria also, we cannot fight ISIS only in Iraq and leave them in Syria. And no one will expect that fighting ISIS only and leaving the Bashar regime in Syria. This is, is not going to work at all. Because uh, people will say, well, uh, he's, he, he killed over 200,000 people in his country. So what's future for a leader, for a president who killed 200,000 people? So I think, you know, we have to be reasonable how we uh, develop this strategy. So uh, 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 in Iraq, integrating Sunnis. In uh, Syria, we have to really not to accept Bashar al-Assad to be there. We have to remove him and we have to, to have re a national reconciliation. Among all the component of the Syrian society has to be included. We have to have a, a uh, in uh, a government which uh, uh, addressed all the needs of the component of the Syrian society. This is something very important. By uh, developing this strategy, I think we can, we can reduce a lot of tension, we can solve a lot of problems, but by taking all the time, whenever there is a problem, we just take m military uh, uh, measure immediately and then we stop. That's not going to solve the problem. So let's uh, let's talk about Assad a bit more um, because Qatar's not alone in saying that Assad must go, but the United States has really backed off from you know Assad must go, and he looked you know it, his fall looked inevitable a few years ago, and people are starting to say, well, it looks like Assad is on it, you know, his gains are or ISIS gains are undermining him and opposition gains are undermining him. But we've kind of been here before with Assad, and he seems perfectly willing to fight to the last Syrian to stay in power. What can be done to change his calculus about whether he will step aside? Um, how do you get Assad to go? You see, now, he's trying to play to show the Americans and the European and the Western in general, either you choose ISIS or me. So uh, he's, he's trying to, to, uh, to, to show everybody like this. But this is not going to solve the problem in, in Syria. Uh, ISIS is very dangerous for everybody. And this regime is dangerous. So we, we cannot really see what's the best of the worst. And, and, and this is very dangerous. If we look at this, uh, if we want to tackle any issue in the region, and we, we, look, we go and look for what's the best of the worst, and then we will continue having, then he will be worse than the other, and then we'll leave, leave the other who is worse than him, and we'll continue doing the, this kind of stuff. This, this strategy is not going to help. It will complicate the region. 
we will have more problems, more, more terrorists uh, coming from all parts of the world, and uh, uh, we'll continue with this problem. I think uh, 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 we have to develop a political process and democratic process. We shouldn't be afraid if we say there is an Islamic movement. There is not all the Islamic mo mo movement are radicals. Look in Tunisia. Look in Turkey now. They had a democracy and uh, Erdogan, he, uh, he, he won, but he lost at the same time. Yeah. But this is democracy. Why we accept in Turkey, in Tunisia, going well, and not to have it in other uh, Arab countries? In Egypt, like what happened in Egypt now, it's complicating the situation in Egypt. We, we should uh, build up a wall between moderate and radical Islam. In Europe and uh, everywhere, you have Christian Democrat, and they are they are political party, and they are accepted. Why do we have Muslim Democrat? <laughs> and this is something very, very important in our society. This is part of our... You have here uh, Catholic, uh, Protestant, Catholic, you accept them. And if they play a, a role and a political role, you accept them. So why don't we accept them in our, as long as they respect the human rights, uh, respect women, minority, uh, political process, democratic process, uh, uh, as long as these principles are, 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 are respected by them, let them play the, the game of democracy. And then, in the end, the people will choose. If they want these people, or in Tunisia, they voted for them, and after uh, four years, they saw they are not, they did not, they vote for another party. So, uh, I think this is the best way that we can solve our problem, reduce the tension, and collaborate together. And then there is another element which is very important in our region, which is economic development. You know, I don't think that religion is the problem in our region. If you go and speak with anybody in the street, in Damascus, in Cairo, in, Mor in Morocco, in uh, Algeria, in Qatar, everywhere, they will tell you, I'm looking for a job. I want to get my children to go to school. I want to have a family. Uh, they, are not, they are not saying more than this. The, the issue is economic issue in our region. We have the employment in some countries is over 40 percent. And uh, the majority in the Arab world, young people, is uh, under 30. So what, what do you expect from these people? So we, don't, we shouldn't really look at the problem as a religious problem. It's not a religious problem. It is economic uh, issue. There is religion, of course, nobody can uh, deny there is. A, but once we uh, develop a strategy to, to address all these, these uh, major issues in the region, I think we can uh, do a lot of things. And even for American presence and security and everything, they will, because the region, they accept the United States. No one wants Russian to be there. No one wants to have Chinese there. They want Americans to be there because American, they have a great values. Uh, everybody respect American vision, uh, dreams. So this is something everybody uh, want to follow and to see how they can benefit from these big values. Well, let's follow up on the U.S. role in the region. Um, there has been frustration about U.S. action in Syria or lack of action um, for some and the latest crisis with Yemen, where the Saudis have taken the lead, launching the airstrikes against, against Yemen with GCC support, with US support, but the Saudis are really out there doing that. And, and you hinted at it in your remarks that there is a, a sense that the US is disengaging from the Middle East, that it's not taking a leadership role in the Middle East, um, and that it's very clearly, um, as you say, wanted. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Assad wants Russia in, in the region, but um, U.S. absence of U.S. leadership will lead to other powers filling that that vacuum. What does constructive U.S. engagement in the region look like? How should the U.S. best engage to help bring about these kind of changes that you think the region needs? First of all, I think uh, United States has to 
consult with the countries in the region. This is very important because we know our region, we know what's uh, the, our problems, and this is very important that uh, before taking any uh, uh, steps, any uh, initiative that uh, United States consult with our, with the whole, this is what in Camp David, you know, we are, uh, we, we think it was a positive uh, step to convene this uh, summit. Uh, it's uh, clearly sent a strong message to, uh, that we are going to face the real challenges in the, in the region. We are going to collaborate together. We are going to, uh, we created uh, a working task and working groups now that uh, we uh, already, uh, they uh, met uh, uh, yesterday and the day before in Saudi Arabia. And now we are going to have to see more dynamic uh, cooperation between United States and uh, GCC country. And I think uh, uh, by doing this thing, uh, we can, we can uh, engage American uh, role in the region. At the same time, uh, we want to be part of this uh, d development in the region. We, we are not expecting the United States to do everything for us. We, United States is a superpower. It has its own interests in the region. Uh, and we are part of this region. We have our our interests, but uh, our interests with the, uh, the interests of the United States. I think we can work together because there are some uh, a lot of in commonality between us, and we can serve each other uh, in the region. So uh, uh, developing a strategy among us, uh, realizing what's the challenges and. Uh, dangers which going on in, in our our region. Uh, all these things will uh, have an uh, important role for the United States and at the same time to reduce your 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 uh, uh, military uh, expenses, you know, to uh, because we, we want to, to play this role. We want to put uh, uh, the boot on the ground, you know, we are ready to do this thing. We don't want the American to come to do everything for us. We are ready to do it by ourselves, but we need to have consultation, we need to have collaboration together, and uh, I think we are going to start now uh, after the the Camp David uh, <coughs> summit. Now I'm going to ask my last question, um, and so I want everyone to be thinking about yours, um, Alex, or someone will be coming around with a microphone. So when it's your turn, um, we will gently pass a microphone to you. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to to take these these hard questions. Um, and so let me ask this last one. Um, you know, Qatar has long been recognized as a mediator in in a lot of these regional conflicts. Um, it maintains relationships with groups. Um, like the Taliban, like Hamas, that the United States and others can't or won't talk to directly, but the United States and others use Qatari channels to talk indirectly to some of these groups. The United States, for example, worked very closely with the Emir um, to secure the release of Bo Bergdahl from Afghanistan in exchange for five Taliban fighters who were released from Guantanamo Bay to Qatar and who just had their travel freezes extended, so they're still hanging out in Qatar. Um, Qatar was also instrumental in securing the release of American journalist uh, Peter Theo Curtis, who is being held by the Al Nursa Front in Syria, because Qatar maintains channels with Al Nursa that the United States <coughs> cannot and won't. Um, but these are groups that many consider not extremist groups, but terrorist groups. And there is, um, Qatar has been on the receiving end of criticism uh, from the United States and from regional allies and others that it finances directly or allows the financing of these terrorist groups from Qatar. The U.S. Department of Treasury has called Qatar one of the most permissive in the world when it comes to funding Al-Qaeda or groups like Al-Qaeda. So do, does your government recognize these criticisms? Have they taken these criticisms, assessed them, and have there been any shifts that have happened to make it harder for potential funding of terrorist groups to take place from Qatar. Thank you for asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it now? <laughs> but I will answer this question. Uh, let me explain first uh, our diplomacy. It works in two fronts. 
politically that, like what you mentioned, we are mediating uh, between um, certain uh, uh, groups or countries and conflict uh, and, and uh, war zone, like what happened in, uh, uh, in Sudan, in Libya, in uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, Palestine. Uh, so all these things, uh, politically, we are doing this thing. A humanitarian uh, side, this is the other side of our diplomacy, that we are working to release hostages taken by militia, by uh, terrorist groups. But uh, this thing, if we can do something, help, we will do it. Because I explained, this is part of our uh, diplomacy of our uh, culture, if we can help uh, releasing a human beings from uh, being uh, hostages for a long time. So we will do it. This is, this is one point. The second thing, you know, it's uh, our region is going through a lot of transformation and a lot of turmoil and a lot of things. And doing this kind of diplomacy in the, in the region. Here, there is a question raised of uh, why Qatar is doing it? Uh, is there any ransom paid? Uh, what kind of uh, finance? So we know this is things, it's coming uh, within we are, our diplomacy in the region. It's once you do this kind of, uh, work it's not easy that people will leave you will criticize you you will see you will see a lot of criticism we we, we are aware of this criticism but we, we it's not going to to stop it from continuing doing uh, what we believe but because if we do not do do this thing who's going to do who's going to release these hostages who's going to uh, uh, help to mediate between these these countries so and there is part of jealousy also in the region once they say this diplomacy Qatar is very uh, uh, active in the region they are uh, the diplomacy is very effective you you find all these question raised they they said uh, so how they are uh, releasing these hostages that's mean they know them they have contact with them but you know, once you, uh, you know, you have to know something about Qatar. Qatar does not have any, any political agenda in the region. The only thing we are seeking is to see stability and peace in the region. Because we are a small country. You said as, si as big as Connecticut or as big as Maine. Uh, uh, so how these countries, they will um, meddle in uh, working with the terrorism in the region. It's, this means that uh, we are putting ourselves in danger if we do these things. But everybody in the region is looking for who's going to solve the problem. The problem is everywhere in our region. If we don't do it because our uh, Qatar is a small country, it doesn't have a lot of restriction. Some countries, the big countries, they cannot do it because they cannot really, uh, we, they don't have vision how to solve this problem because we are not only mediating and releasing hostage. We come with a, a, a plan, with a vision of we can uh, collaborate economically in the region. We can have investment coming. So we, can, we solve this problem by having a, a, a plan to, to really solve the, this problem. But Qatar that does not finance terrorism, the, the terrorism for us is the most dangerous thing, and we stood very firm against financing. And if anyone, individual or citizen, is uh, taking any of these uh, kind of uh, steps, uh, he will be putting in the court and uh, uh, will be... Uh, 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 will be very strict uh, applying our law. Our law is very clear. Your government, they know what uh, what we are doing. Uh, regarding 
Taliban or five Taliban. By the way, Qatar, they just opened the uh, five guys hamburger. <laughs> so, <laughs> five guys. Five guys. so we have five Taliban and five guys now. <laughs> uh, 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 in these kind of cases, Qatar does not volunteer to come and solve the problem. We are asked from others, like United States, they want us to play this role. And uh, the other party, they accept Qatar to mediate. So uh, Qatar never come to and take this kind of uh, work, you know, unless we've been asked. And secondly, if we know the humanitarian, we can help, like this is part of our diplomacy, that we are going to release uh, the surgeon from uh, Afghanistan and at the same time we can uh, have these guys uh, in Qatar. Uh, we try to uh, talk to them, to convince them to contribute for stability in, the, in, uh, in Afghanistan because uh, uh, when we, uh, neg we uh, negotiated with them we thought we might, once we have them in Qatar, we can talk to them how they can play a positive role. And this is something very important. No one will continue in, uh, in war and in, uh, uh, sometime uh, through the dialogue, through uh, having people close to you, you can, you can talk to them and you, you will see probably you will get very positive results. Uh, this is the second thing regarding Hamas. Hamas, also American government contacted us. Condoleezza Rice, when she was a um, minister, she called our government and they, she asked them, go and speak with Hamas and tell them if they accept the to enter in the election, Palestinian election, and they win, we will accept them. So that time we, we said, are you sure, you know, before you... <laughs> We go and speak with them. She said yes. So we went there. We spoke with Hamas because the American asked us to do that. And we told them, you know, we have a message for, uh, from you, from American government. So if you uh, enter in the election and you win, they will deal with you. They said, are you sure, Hamas? <laughs> uh, we said, yes, we are sure. You know, we, uh, this is what we, uh, they told us. So unfortunately, afterwards, they ignore, they change everything, and the Hamas won, and uh, uh, we could really uh, solve a lot of problems with them, because in the end, peace is between enemies, it's not between friends. You never have peace with, between friends. So uh, uh, these, these uh, faction or movement, they are strong in the street. Either you like them or not. They are there. So if you want peace, you have to speak with them. Look, the IRA, they, it's the same thing. And now the I mean, United States is speaking with Iran. Uh, they were the enemy number one, and they, the Iranians consider American enemy number one, and they are talking to them. So we have to, to, to say, if you want peace in the Middle East, if we want to have peace between Palestinians and Israelis, we have, now we have uh, the most uh, radical government in Israel, and we have Hamas. So peace, it can have to peace between these two, otherwise we cannot have peace in the region. So uh, this is uh, what, uh, but for sure, uh, Qatar stands very firm against terrorism, and our law that your government and the uh, Ministry of Treasury, they know about it. We meet with them uh, on a regular uh, basis, and we, uh, we explain to them what we are doing. They come to Doha and they check, and uh, we are doing our, our best. We, we are not saying we can solve a lot of problems overnight. This is not, can, it cannot be, you know, once you have a problem here, say, okay, go and solve it. We go solve it right away. Sometimes you cannot do it, but we are collaborating with your government, uh, uh, fighting counter-terrorism, we have a, a regular meeting in Washington and in, in Doha, 
and we are open to uh, c collaborate all the time. Thank you very much for taking that question. Um, and now it's your turn. Um, please raise your hand. We'll get the microphone to you. Um, and I'm, I tend to favor like one front side of the room to even try and make sure that we're spreading the opportunities. Um, where was, right here, Alex, I can Hi, um, first of all, I just want to thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and the World Affairs Council for holding this event. Um, my name is Makisa Bronson. I am a junior at Inglemore High School in their International Baccalaureate program. And I also um, participate in MUN, so I think it was you that participated in it. Yeah, okay, so yeah, that's cool. Um, so um, as someone who's a part of International Baccalaureate and also MUN, I'm really interested in um, like world development, which is pretty much all you've been talking about. Um, and I was actually selected to participate this summer in a leadership exchange program called the Iraqi Youth Leadership Exchange Program. And um, I believe it's actually funded by the World Affairs Council. And so essentially what that is, is it brings um, 27 Iraqi high school students over to the East Coast. And then it selected um, nine other US high school students besides myself um, to also fly over there. And we're going to participate in um, cultural exchange activities and talk about differences between our two societies and how we can kind of bridge that gap. Um, sorry, I'll try and keep this short. So um, recently I was talking with one of the Iraqi high school students that was selected over Skype and, um, or wait, no, maybe it was over Facebook message. Okay, anyway, um, we were just talking and making um, small conversation and it happened so happened that um, our plans for after high school were brought up and um, I was, he was asking me what I wanted to major in after high school and I was telling him, oh, I wanna go to um, Columbia University and I want to major in international relations or human rights because I'm really interested in that. And then I said, what about you? And um, it kind of surprised me because what he said was that um, since ISIS has gradually taken more control in that region, as you stated before. Um, there's really no way of telling whether or not people, um, or rather um, youth in that region, will be able to have a chance to go to college and stuff, um, which is something that I think people in the US take for granted. So I was very surprised, or not really surprised, like I guess it, it makes a lot of sense why he said that um, he wasn't sure whether or not he would be able to go to college after high school. But um, I don't know, that was really an impactful moment for me because it just made me realize how um, important secondary education or tertiary education is in the US, yet um, how I feel that some people don't really um, appreciate it for what it's worth. So I was just wondering, um, to what extent do you think that we as a world society will be able to um, kind of repair the damage that has been done in Iraq and um, the rest of the Gulf region to um, students' educational opportunities after they graduate from high school. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I believe on the exchange of uh, students between uh, the whole Middle East and United States, you know, either to Iraq, to Qatar, because we, we uh, also organize a, a lot of uh, 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 the exchange of students between uh, Qatar and United States. Last time, just a month ago, we had around 15 students, American students, they visited Qatar. And also, we are trying to make, organize like uh, the Arab League model you know, and they come to uh, uh, the delegation who are representing Qatar, they go to Doha and uh, meet with some people uh, in the ministry, in the uh, media, in the street, with people to talk and to see how the country is. Uh, uh, Qatar believes highly in education because uh, um, we believe that uh, rooting education in the region is uh, uprooting radicalism. Uh, and we have to invest a lot in education. Qatar has the educational city, 
I don't know if you have uh, heard about it. We are hosting 11 international universities, six among them are Americans. And we thank you very much for giving us the best American university in the region. You know, we have Cornell, we have uh, uh, Georgetown, uh, Texas A&M, uh, uh, Virginia Commonwealth. So uh, they're attracting a lot of uh, students uh, coming from everywhere. And we left this uh, university to uh, um, have their own uh, policy. We do not interfere. That means they can get professor from anywhere they want. They can accept students from anywhere they want. Even students coming from Israel, if they are, they apply for any university and they they, they come to Qatar. We have no problem. We accept them to come to uh, to any university in uh, in, in Doha. So. Uh, uh, beside that also, uh, we are helping a lot by hosting these universities, which is benefiting mainly the girls who are not able to go and study abroad. So you will see the majority of students in the university in Qatar are girls, which is something excellent, you know, they, I think this is something helping uh, women to develop their knowledge and to, to be a leader in the, in the region. Uh, Qatar also uh, created a fund for scholarship and we put hundred million dollars for any student in the region, not only Qatari, any Arab countries. The, anyone gets uh, uh, Excellent, we, we have some uh, criteria. If they f meet this criteria, they can apply for the scholarship and they can go anywhere they want, any university, in Europe, in the United States, and after they finish, we guarantee job for them in Qatar. If they want, if they don't want, they are free to go, but you know, we can, after scholarship, you can get a job, which is something great. This is what we are saying, empowerment of youth. This is what Qatar is doing in the region, because empowerment of youth, we can solve that. We talked about terrorism, we talked about radicalism, we talked about uh, sectarian strife in Iraq. Uh, uh, all this, we have to solve it by education. We are allocating from our budget 12% annually for education, the highest uh, percentage, even more than the United States. I believe the United States, they have 7% uh, with the comparison with the big budget, but you know, we say I'm just, <laughs> we are allocating 12% of our uh, budget for, for education. So uh, I hope that, you know, we want to have to see stability in Iraq. It's a very important country. Uh, we want to see all the component of the uh, Iraqi society to work together. The Kurds, the Sunni, the Shiites, they are Iraqis. They have to work for their, their country to, to uh, uh, create their uh, national uh, government. But if they uh, let the other uh, forces meddle in their affairs, that will be a big problem. And if they of, uh, ignore any of their components, also a problem. So we have to, this, this everything depends on the Iraqi's leadership and Iraqi's government and willingness to solve this problem. I think Iraq, it is important country, very rich country, uh, even uh, human uh, resources are uh, uh, the best doctors, the best engineers in the Arab world are, are from Iraq. And we hope that we see the Iraq uh, 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 come back uh, as a, an important actor in the region. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, the West has been meddling in Eastern affairs for quite a while. And my question is um, relating all the way back to after World War I, there were quite a number of um, sovereign boundaries that were designed by British and French and Western uh, diplomats. And after World War I, World War II, there's been a lot of lines drawn, countries created. Uh, are those lines relevant still? Should there be different sovereign lines in the Middle East? Well, I think uh, we, uh, even with our, the, this line which has been uh, drawn by the British and French, we still have problem. If we change, if we go back, it will be a big problem. I think the most important thing now, uh, we have to uh, realize that globalization now, it's doesn't know any borders. So it's the most important thing for, for us now to work together, to collaborate with, with each other, uh, uh, to launch big project, economic project in the region, to make people benefit. Uh, this project, for example, Qatari project in Tunisia, everybody's benefiting from create jobs. I think this is the challenge now. But no one in the region thinks about the borders. Or if we think about the, about the borders, look at what's going on in Iraq, for example. Now uh, people think that we have to divide Iraq to three uh, countries, the uh, Kurd and the Sunni and the Shias. But is it going to solve this problem? It's not going to. It will complicate the, the problem. So I think we have, we have to... Uh, have the spirit of uh, cooperation more than the division. And uh, we shouldn't go back to the history because each country in the region has a problem with its neighbor. There is no single country that does not have a, a border problem. So I think we should be very careful in this thing and uh, we should uh, think of how we can develop project among us and uh, live together like what the European now. What's the border between uh, France and uh, Belgium? It's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. They, they work together and they have uh, the TGV, uh, the Dallas train going from Belgium, Bruxelles to Paris and they, there is no border. Hopefully we will, and, and the European, they went through the 30 years war which was more worse than what's going on in our region. So uh, hopefully that uh, we can uh, have the spirit of the uh, European Union and uh, we can work together in the, in the Middle East. And this thing will, will help everybody, the Israelis, the Palestinians, the Qataris, and everybody in the region we can live and work together. I can have a very quick follow-up to that, because in your remarks you, you mentioned uh, the GCC becoming a unified political actor. Do you mean like the EU, building to that kind of unified political actor? Yeah, you know, uh, of course, you know, because uh, 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 the GCC, uh, uh, it is an organization which is, uh, the if you see the social fabric, the most uh, uh, coherent uh, uh, area in the in the Arab world is the GCC country. Like I am from Qatar, I have family uh, in Saudi Arabia, I have family uh, in Bahrain, I have family in Kuwait. So it is it is like uh, one nation, and uh, that will be much easier for us in the region that GCC country they get closer to each other more than probably with the other Arab countries, which will take more time. But it doesn't mean we don't have uh, something in common. We have the most important thing is the language, the culture. And this is uh, from Morocco till Oman. We have the same culture, the same language. Religion, of course, you know, we have the Shias, we have the Sunni. You know, we have to live with the difference, with differences. So it doesn't matter, you know, because our region, it's going through a lot of turmoil. So don't expect everybody to agree with the other. Each one has uh, different views, but 
this kind of debate or uh, different views it can enrich our region. It does not really uh, create any problem. You know, we don't because you are living in the United States here. You have so different views. You have the Republican, Democrats. Uh, you see uh, even Republican, how many candidates now? Uh, so it's uh, uh, these kind of uh, things, you know, we, we in the Middle East, we have, we have to li live with this thing. Uh, let's get, I haven't gone to the back yet. Alex, can you? Still, there's no hard question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I was in uh, Qatar uh, just two weeks ago, teaching at the six universities that you're hosting there, and was very impressed with the construction work that's going on in the 15,000 hectares that have been set aside for the Qatar um, Foundation and the building that's happening there. Can you speak a little bit to the human rights of all of the imported workers that have been brought in to do that construction work? Uh, thank you for raising this question, I think, uh, first of all, uh, we uh, appreciate very much of having these uh, workers working in Qatar because they are helping us for developing our country. And uh, we have to create uh, a condition uh, for them to uh, meet uh, international standard, and this is uh, something very important for us. And uh, we know that uh, uh, there are some issues regarding the labor should be addressed. Uh, and we are very uh, open, and our Ministry of uh, uh, Labor has taken uh, uh, a lot of uh, measures to, uh, to, to solve uh, this problem. But we believe in the same time uh, that uh, uh, these, uh, some of these issues being exaggerated in media. Uh, look at uh, what's happened, uh, Qatar just hosting World Cup, and this issue has became like a big issue in Qatar. We know that uh, to host a World Cup, it's not, uh, uh, it's not easy, you will see a lot of uh, people uh, talking about uh, this country, uh, Islamic country, they are not going to get the alcohol, the, uh, hum uh, 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 the, the homosexuals, they are not going to have right to go to Qatar. We, we are not going to stop all of these things. We said that so many, many times, you know, these kind of things, it will be uh, uh, because we, uh, this project, the World Cup, it will be with the with the FIFA. It's not only Qatar is organizing it. So uh, 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 regarding the the uh, go back to the, the the labor, I think we have to uh, create a, a, a condition for uh, the labor who are working. They have to to get their right completely. Uh, we are not only the the government who are the concerned, also the. Uh, international and local companies are concerned on these things, and we uh, we made a lot of progress by uh, by by enhancing uh, uh, reform and legislation. Uh, and and I'm not saying that this is the whole things, but we need to continue uh, addressing this concern, which is something very important for us. And if you have seen all this, uh, what happened since a year or two years. There are so many uh, progress happen. We we introduce a lot of reforms, legislations. Uh, 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 we are checking uh, in all uh, the uh, government, the companies, what they are doing there. We uh, we increase the inspectors in the country to go and check in the companies how they are treating their their labors, and we are open for any criticism because sometimes it's it's. Uh, 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 helping us to develop uh, our our country, and if uh, there is anything that we can uh, uh, add for uh, enhancing the the law and the reforms and legislation for the labor, we will do it, and we are continuing doing it. Thank you. How many migrant laborers are, or how many laborers are in Qatar? 
Well, I think uh, it's uh, almost uh, one million. A million and two hundred, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, a leader right behind you. Thank you for speaking with us today, Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador. Um, your relationship with Saudi Arabia is showing us that um, the relationship of ally is not as clear cut as it has been. And I think that the US is finding that with their relationship that we're attempting to establish with Iran um, and in regards to ISIS and uh, state terrorism, state-sponsored terrorism. So with ISIS, as I watch their mega IEDs blow up in Syria, Syria for example, uh, it just makes me think, I wonder if it's only a matter of time before they contact North Korea and purchase a bomb. And so it, it makes good sense for us to want to work together to stop ISIS. On the other hand, uh, Iran is sponsoring Hamas, which is not as terrible for terrorism as it once was, but there's still terrorism. And uh, now the Houthis in Yemen. So my question is, their strategy with that, but what is their end goal that they're trying to accomplish with that strategy? Thank you. You mean the strategy of Iran? The, the strategy of Iran, yes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I said it in my rem remarks, we have to uh, stop uh, Iran from meddling in the Arab affairs. <laughs> This is something very, very important. Iran is an important country for us. Uh, we want to have a good relation. It's our neighbor. Uh, it has to play a role in the region. This is no, no doubt about it. But uh, uh, middling in the Arab affairs, uh, uh, creating militia, sending arms, recruiting uh, uh, young people there, and this is not going to, to stabilize the region. And, and we said that to them, you know, we said, that, you know, you are more than welcome to come to any Arab country to create a cultural center, Iranian cultural center, not to create militia. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, the Camp David summit, it sent very clear message that United States and the GCC country, they will face all these challenges. And uh, we have to develop a strategy together. At the same time, we are expecting, hopefully, after the agreement which will be signed, a nuclear agreement with Iran, to see Iran playing a positive role. Because uh, 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 we cannot uh, see, uh, accept in the Arab world that Iran is meddling in our affair in, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, and this is not going to, to, to contribute for, for the peace in the, in the region. Thank you. All right, well, it is about the witching hour. I'm sorry, the, uh, the ambassador's had a long day that's not no, over yet. Please, what, yeah? Yes. I'm, okay, I'm, all right. Um, we'll take uh, uh, one more. Um, you've had your hand up for a while, Alex, if you can. So we're giving Alex a bit of a workout tonight, too. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, you've talked about Syria a great deal during this discussion. Um, there are numerous armed groups in Syria. And they've had differences before, and they've expressed those differences with intense violence. Um, in any post-Assad Syria, it seems very likely that there's a good chance there could be a failed state similar to Somalia or more recently Libya. Uh, are Qatar and the GCC countries well prepared for that possibility? First of all, uh, we don't want to, uh, Syria to be the same thing like what happened in Iraq, that we dismantle the army and this whole uh, uh, political party, all these things. We, we, we are not uh, seeking to have the same model of what happened in Iraq. Syria, we have to uh, protect the structure of the, the country, the state, the army, and I said in my remark, removing Assad, not the, the government. So this is 
uh, uh, something very, very important. And we have to uh, uh, recognize the actors in the ground. I mean that not the terrorist groups, but the, 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 the political and the, opposite, the Syrian opposition, the moderate, who are fighting against uh, the regime. So uh, 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 we are not working to see Syria like Libya, what's happening in Libya now. We don't want to, to see what's happening in Iraq and Syria. So we are trying to collaborate with international community, with United States, with the countries in the region, to see how we can help the uh, Syrian people. Because in the end, it's the Syrian people who are going to choose what kind of government they want. But they need their the help that we can, uh, we can help them now. This is very important. We don't, look what happened in Libya. After we overthrew Gaddafi, we left the Libyan people. We did not help them because they came from scratch. They did not have any, any, constitu any institutions. No, no, there is no uh, uh, legal base, nothing. And then we were busy in other countries in the, in the, during the Arab Spring. So uh, Syria, uh, it is more important than Libya because if we do not have stability and peace in Syria, the whole region will be in flame because Syria important for the peace and stability in the whole region. And we are working to really help the Syrian people not to work with one group against the other. The, all the components of the Syrian community, uh, society, they have to be included in this political and democratic process. The Alawites, the Christian, the Kurd, the uh, Druze, the Sunni, the Shiites, all of them has to be part of the government and of the future, the Syrian, the future of Syria. So uh, uh, I think we have to, uh, we can do a lot of things, we can help the Syrian people, and in the end they will choose what kind of government they want. Thank you, we'll be continuing our discussion on the Middle East next week with a uh, lunch discussion next Wednesday on Turkey's election and what that means, and Syria will come up in that as well. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your willingness to take questions across the board. Thank you very much. Uh, I am really a great honor to be with you, and this is the second time to be the World Affairs Council. Last time I was in Houston, and this time in Seattle, and I uh, thank you very much, and I hope that my answer was uh, uh, satisfied and clear <laughs> and uh, you know this is something uh, we should uh, continue our debate this is the most important thing you're thank welcome you. back anytime thank you